Welcome to Lesson 13 in our study of the Post-Exilic Prophets. This particular lesson will look at Zechariah chapter 6. It includes the eighth and final vision that he has given, and then the resumption of more direct messages and directions that God has to deliver to his people through his chosen prophet, Zechariah. Judging by the number of views of the items that we are posting on YouTube, it appears that quite a few of you are taking advantage of our postings of our Sunday morning services. We have expanded the video to include the entire service, not just the sermon. If you're not already doing so, I encourage you to check out our Wednesday evening summer series videos. Those feature guest speakers, each speaking on the topic related around the theme of Revive Us Again. We look forward to the time when conditions allow all of you to join us in person again. But know that we understand that there are those of you in situations where it's simply not safe for you to be out yet and among people. Know that we understand that, we support you, and we look forward to when you can join us again. Now let's turn to our study. As we study chapter 6, the first eight verses record the final vision in that series of visions that are presented to Zechariah. Most commentators accept that these visions were provided in sequence and that they all occurred in the span of uh, one short period of time. It involves a, this final vision involves a series of four chariots that present some symbolism that bears resemblance to what we are familiar with in the book of Revelation. The final seven verses provide the first of the more direct messages and directions that will be found throughout re the remainder of the book of Zechariah. We'll begin by reading the entirety of the text for today's lesson, so that as we examine the individual verses, we'll see them in the context of the entire message. As usual, I've included the text from the English Standard Version. Let's begin in verse 1. Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between two mountains, and the mountains were of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven, after presenting themselves before the Lord of all earth. The chariot with the black horses goes toward the north country, the white ones go after them and the dappled ones go on toward the south country. When the strong horses came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. And the word of the Lord came to me. Take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedediah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold, and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, the man whose name is Branch, for he shall branch out from this place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Halem, Tobijah, Jedediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Let's return to the first four verses and look at them more closely. Again I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four chariots came out from between the two mountains. And the mountains were mountains of bronze. The first chariot had red horses, the second black horses, the third white horses, and the fourth chariot dappled horses, all of them strong. Then I answered and said to the angel who talked with me, 
What are these, my lord? Again, without prompting, Zechariah's attention is drawn to another vision. The visual image is of four chariots emerging from between two mountains that are made of brass. The brass mountains are not literal, of course, and as usual, commentators have come up with many meanings for what they, they symbolize. I feel it's important we not overthink their meaning, as no explanation is provided in the text. However, of the various suggestions I have read, the most practical one I see is to visualize the mountains as a symbol of God's power and stability. The chariots are going to represent the exercise of God's plan and judgment. The mountains have contained or restrained them until the appropriate time. In verses 2 and 3, Zechariah provides detail that dist distinguishes the various chariots by the color of the horses which draw them. We can see some similarity between these distinctions and those made in Revelation chapter 6 of the four horses and their horsemen. There we had a white horse with a rider who was wearing a crown and went forth to conquer. A red horse whose rider took peace from the earth, turning man against man. A black horse whose rider would bring affliction in the form of famine and pestilence. And a horse described, uh, described as either dappled, grizzled, pale, or spotted, depending on the translation you read. And that, that horse's rider is death. Each of them were sent forth at the breaking of the seal to carry out the task that God had assigned them. As so often occurs, commentators have made any, many interpretations for the symbolism of the various chariots. <clears throat> Some perceive them to be various world powers or empires, yet even those who hold this opinion don't agree on which world empires are represented. An example of this, some believe that the red horse represents Babylon, the black horse the Persians, the white horse is the Greeks, and the dappled horse is the Romans. Citing that the red are not later mentioned as we read on, because the Babylonian Empire has already fallen at this point to the Persians. Whether we see the four as world empires, or as some commentators believe as angels, as suggested, the chariots represent the execution of God's orders and plans. We're told that all of them are strong in verse 3. All of the chariot and horse combinations have been given the power to accomplish the task that God has assigned them. If they are empires, each empire was raised and given its power by the providence of God to accomplish a purpose that he had for them. If the chariots represent angels, they would lack the power to accomplish their task unless God had given it to them. Verse 4 demonstrates that Zechariah continues to have the right attitude, asking the angel to provide an explanation for the vision. It would be unwise for us to presume we know more than what the explanation provides. That brings us to the second half of this vision, verses 5 through 8. Remember, Zechariah has just asked the angel for an explanation of the vision, and it begins here in verse 5. And the angel answered and said to me, These are going out to the four winds of heaven, after presenting themselves before the Lord of all the earth. The chariot with the black horses goes towards the north country. The white ones go after them, and the dappled ones go to the south country. When the strong horses that came out, they were impatient to go and patrol the earth. And he said, Go, patrol the earth. So they patrolled the earth. Then he cried to me, Behold, those who go toward the north country have set my spirit at rest in the north country. Verse 5 is an instance where I believe other translations provide a more accurate re rendering of the verse. Um, let me share with you the King James Version. And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. To me, this verse makes a clear case to understand the vision to represent angels working at the bidding of God, rather than empires. If we need an example of these, consider the four living creatures that we encounter in Revelation chapter 4. 
the four horsemen of Revelation chapter 6, and the four angels holding back the winds in Revelation chapter 7. In each case, they represent heavenly beings or create creatures that are performing the bidding of God. The angels represented by the chariots are dispatched to the north and south. We need not take that literally. Simply this means that they are dispatched to the known world of Zechariah and his contemporaries. To them, everything they knew of either existed to the north or to the south. The agents are anxious to go and fulfill the task they've been given. I get the image of a horse straining against its, its bridle, wanting to run, but it's held in check until the time is right. I believe this rate relates back to the image of the brass mountains being the steadfastness of God, having unlimited power at his disposal and yet restraining it until the proper time. Like a rider cracking a whip, they're turned loose when told to go patrol the earth. They're not restrained to an area, but patrol the whole earth. The idea here is that God is active and engaged in his creation, and his true servants are prepared to do what he bids them. There are two common interpretations of verse 8 among commentators, one being that the events described have already taken place, this event that has set uh, the spirit at rest. In that case, they believe that these uh, events represent the disciplining of Judah via the Babylonian captivity, and then the discipline of Babylon by virtue of Persia overtaking it. And that these events have satisfied his need for justice, justice in dealing with his own people in, in the Jews and represented by Judah, justice in dealing with those who had exceeded what he had, a, had anticipated or wanted in terms of their disciplining being the Babylonians when they were overthrown by the Persians. This can kind of be suggested by several translations. Let me share with you the New American Standard. Then he cried out to me and spoke to me, saying, See, those who are going to the land of the north have appeased my wrath in the land of the north. The other interpretation is that God's spirit will settle in the north. It will continue to drive the rise and conquest of empires that will be seen in the centuries to follow. Verse 8 concluded the vision. Verse 9 will begin a series of messages that God will deliver that are more customary to what we're uh, used to a prophet receiving. As I've mentioned before in our study, chapter breaks were introduced long after these writings were recorded. It's not necessary to presume that the events beginning in verse 9 immediately follow the vision that concluded in verse 8. Let's uh, read the opening verses of this uh, new message that God has given through Zechariah, beginning in verse 9. And the word of the Lord came to me, Take from the exiles Heldai, Tobijah, Jedidiah, who have arrived from Babylon, and go the same day to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Take from them silver and gold and make a crown, and set it on the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. The word of the Lord comes to him. It's no longer a vision, but direct instruction. This is similar to what we saw in the opening of chapter 1. Commentators differ on what is represented in verse 10. Are the named among those who returned at first, or are they those who have come since the initial return? Some suggested they are even very recent arrivals. They're not mentioned in Ezra's history of the return, so it seemed more likely that they had returned after the initial group, similar to Ezra himself or Nehemiah. In any case, they are Jewish men who have returned from Babylon and either had great wealth themselves or carried back offerings or collections from others who were still in Babylon and wanted to support the work that was going on in Jerusalem. Zechariah is instructed to find them and take them to the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. These men have brought gifts, including gold and silver, from Babylon, which they likely intended to deliver to Zerubbabel, 
for support in building the temple and or Joshua to support the service of the temple. God directs Zechariah to utilize a portion of this gift to have a crown made. Based on various translations, this can un be understood to be a single crown made of both material or possibly multiple crowns or a crown that has multiple sections. Zechariah is to place the crown on the head of Joshua, the high priest. This would likely seem improper to Zechariah and his contemporaries, as this crown was not the type of headdress that Moses had been instructed to have made for the priest, but it's the type of crown that would be reserved for a king. Joshua was, was not qualified to be king, and he was not, as he was not a descendant of David. The offices of king and priest were distinct and could not be occupied by the same person. We have the benefit today of seeing the fulfillment of this sign, making it easier for us to understand its meaning. Note that there is no direction to anoint Joshua nor declare him king, but Zechariah is merely instructed to place the crown on Joshua's head. Verse 12 will pro provide a greater meaning of, of this message. Let's continue the message beginning in verse 12. And say to him, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold the man whose name is the branch. For he shall branch out from his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. It is he who shall build the temple of the Lord, and shall bear royal honor, and shall sit and rule on his throne. And there shall be a priest on his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crown shall be in the temple of the Lord as a reminder to Halem, Tobijah, Jediah, and Hen, the son of Zephaniah. As the crown is placed on the head of Joshua, Zechariah is to tell him of one who is coming, whose name is Branch. The vision described in chapter 3, beginning in verse 8, told of a coming servant whose name is Branch. This was a prophecy of the coming Messiah, Christ. Joshua here stands as a type or shadow of something to come, that being Christ. Those who are faithful to, for those who are faithful to God, Christ will be their king and their high priest. There has been one other instance of someone who has been both king and priest, that being Melchizedek, king of Salem in the days of Abraham. Psalm 110 verse 4 records an oath that God had made regarding the Messiah who was to come, and it says, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Christ will be the fulfillment of that oath, and the fulfillment of the sign that is given by placing the crown on Joshua's head. It's said that he will branch out. This is realized in two senses. First, in the sense that the, these people and this territory will produce a Messiah, meaning that he will come from this area and these people. Secondly, that his impact will begin here in this land, but will branch out and affect the entire world. Verse 12 ends with, he shall build, build the temple. The idea here is not the physical temple, which the people are currently working on, but the spiritual temple, the church. Verse 13 reiterates, <coughs> he will build the temple. Christ will build the spiritual temple, the church. He will bear royal honor because the faithful will recognize him as their king. Christ will sit on the throne to rule as king and serve as high priest. This was likely a hard concept for Zechariah's audience, but again, we have the benefit of seeing its fulfillment to help us understand. Once we do understand that the temple which is spoken of is the church, several New Testament scriptures shed light on this statement. Matthew 16, verse 18, refers to the rock that is Peter's confession that Jesus was the Christ, Son of the living God. And it says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 through 21, we have, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And then in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. All of these are examples of the church to come that would be built. It's not a physical place, it's the collection of the faithful. It says that there'll be a council of peace. Traditionally, the offices of king and priest are separate and distinct, and can even create rivalries or challenges. But in Christ, the offices of king and priest will work in unison. There'll be no competition and no jealousy. Note that Joshua was not to wear the crown. The ceremony was a sign of the future Joshua, Jesus. The crown was not intended for Joshua to serve as a ruler or identify him as a king, nor did it afford him any new authority or office. The crown was to be placed in the temple to serve as a reminder to all who read or hear the message of God that's provided through Zechariah that the Messiah is coming and that he will encompass both of these offices in one being. This message concludes with verse 15. And those who are far off shall come and help to build the temple of the Lord, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. Zechariah's contemporaries may well have understood this verse as pertaining to the rebuilding of the temple that was currently in progress. Jews continued to return to Jerusalem from Babylon to provide financial assistance, as well as the, the continued support that the Jews received from neighboring re regions at the order of King Darius of Persia, which we read of this in the book of Ezra. But most scholars see this as a reference to the, te this reference to the temple that's referred to in verse 13, the church. While the Jewish people expected to be alone in the end relationship with God, the true church would be built up of people from all nations, including those who are far off. You shall know the Lord has sent me. And there are multiple perspectives on what this uh, can mean. When his contemporaries see others supporting completion of the temple, they will understand that Zechariah is speaking on behalf of God and not of his own. Of his own. Secondly, it can be applied to the church, an evidence of Christ's role in our lives as both our king and our high priest. Then it said, that this shall come to pass. The idea here is not, uh, excuse me, the idea here is, uh, it's not whether or not Christ will come, as this was going to happen whether the Jewish people cooperated or not. But what can come to pass if they obey is their inclusion in the church in future generations. We'll see in the time of Christ that there were many who were not willing to accept Christ as the Messiah. And yet throughout their history, they had been provided prophecies similar to this one of his coming and others that developed his nature and how they would identify him. Christ fulfilled all of those. And if they were had been obedient people, and obeyed the voice of God, meaning listening to the prophets and what they had told them about the coming Messiah, they would have had no difficulty identifying Christ as that Messiah. Well, that concludes our study of uh, Lesson 13, and uh, looking at Chapter 6 of Zechariah. Our next lesson will look at Chapter 7. It's a message from God regarding justice, mercy, and proper service. I encourage you to read ahead for that study. And as always, I remind you that you can find updates and links to our online content at our website at www.sawcoc.org, as well as finding us on Facebook, search for 6th and Washington Streets Church of Christ. Thank you for joining me. I hope you're finding these studies uh, beneficial, and I look forward to the time when we can all be together again.